Hey guys, another driving video. Because it's a busy day and I'm trying to get a bunch of stuff done while also speaking to you. I meant to do this video for a few days now and haven't had a chance to do it, but it's an important message. Um, this is gonna be a little personal one, guys. Um, and it's something that is the basis of my whole reason for coming on YouTube way back when in the beginning. Um, and it's some, it's a topic that my heart is very, very tender for. Um, I want to give you a little basis of where my faith started, where what my faith journey has been, so that you can kind of get an understanding of some of the things I'm going to say in this video. I was raised as a Roman Catholic when I was a child. You know, I went through catechism and all that stuff. Um, and anybody who's been through that as a kid in Roman Catholicism, you know that you don't really get a very strong biblical um, upbringing um, in catechism and, and in the Roman Catholic Church. It's more traditions and Catholic dogmas and the catechisms and the Eucharists and the sacraments and all of that stuff you learn about, but you don't really learn much about Jesus, the cross, the gospel, or any of like the kind of important stuff, right? It's just really more traditions and things like that. Um, and then once I got of age and I obviously, you know, stopped going to catechism, I went through a period of, you know, no church or anything. And it wasn't until high school when a girl from school um, brought me to her church, which was a very charismatic kind of Pentecostal type of church, that I really started coming back to the faith and digging in and starting to read the word. And I didn't really have a lot of guidance. Um, I was a brand spanking new babe in Christ, if you will. Um, and I had really no direction, no shepherd. Um, the the church that I had been going to was very much about, you know, singing and emotions and worship. But again, not a lot of biblical education. Um, so I was kind of on my own and I'm looking at the Bible and I and I think, you know, it's just like any other book. I'm going to start it from the beginning. I'm going to just open it and go cover to cover and start from the beginning. And for a new believer, that is a mistake. That is a big, fat mistake to do that as a new believer, because when reading through the Old Testament, you need to do so through the lens of the gospel message. And if you don't understand the place of the Old Testament, um, it's going to confuse you. It's going to confound you and it can do what it did to me. And it can alter kind of permanently and malign the character of God and how you see God because you're reading all of these passages in the Old Testament where God is wiping out all of civilization with a flood and he's ordering Israel to move in and butcher men, women, and children um, of neighboring towns and villages. And you know you hear about this golden calf that the Israel Israelites started worshiping. And so God orders the men that didn't bow down to the golden calf to go and execute their own family by the sword who did, and 2,000 people are slain by the sword, many of which are their own loved ones, their own family. And you hear about all these horrifying things when you're reading the Old Covenant. And when you do this and you read these things without an understanding of the gospel and what these things are actually spiritually alluding to, it's going to malign the character of God for you. Um, and you're gonna start to view God in a very specific light. You're gonna start to see him as cruel and mean and unloving because you're not understanding why he's doing these things what these things represent because you're not reading the the these passages through the lens of the gospel and so my early upbringing um really started to malign the character of god for me once i graduated from this pentecostal church and i started you know looking elsewhere in protestantism um, I started doing what most of us on the channel did. I started reaching out to the big name pastors, you know, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, Paul Washer, John Piper, Ray Comfort, all of these, these big name pastors that everyone trusts and go to. I found myself listening to them as well. That's what everybody trusted. That's the people that everybody went to. 
And so I found myself listening to a lot of these teachers myself. Um, there was one man, I think his name was Tim Conway. He was a real bad one. <laughs> I listened to Tim Conway for a little while and I remember I would turn off the video and I would be like trembling. Like I was terrified um, of the messages that I was hearing because 90% of what you're gonna hear from these individuals are, you're a tear, you are a Judas, you are unsaved, you're a goat, you're not a sheep. 90% um, of you in this congregation think you're saved and you're not. Test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. And even if you are showing all of these, these signs and good things and doing this and doing that, it's still really not uh, assured that you're really one of the elect. Um, you know, you got to test yourself. You got to look at yourself. You got to fruit inspect yourself. And, you know, even then, even if you do find this unnamed number of fruit, you're still not assured that you're really one of the elect, that you're really saved. And, you know, you guys have all heard this. It's what 90% of Christianity is when you, when you search a, a Bible passage or you search a church. 90% of them are all intertwined in, in these kinds of teachings, these, these doctrines. And so this is all that you're exposed to. Um, and I found that some of these guys and some of their teaching were so depraved and so, uh, I don't know if depraved is a good word, so just dark so fear-mongering and so terrifying that it almost made Roman Catholicism sound like good news. I mean, there was times, many times, where I just, I thought maybe, maybe the Roman Catholic Church has it right, because some of this teaching that I was hearing was so terrifying and so, it just robbed me of any joy or assurance or, or peace that I, I, there was honestly times where I, I thought back to my youth, like, okay, I, I grew up in Roman Catholicism. I don't remember being terrified then. You know, maybe I should go back to Roman Catholicism. I mean, this is, this is what was literally going through my mind. You know, some of this teaching was so bad and so scary and so terrifying that it literally made Roman Catholicism look like good news. And so this was the upbringing that I grew up with as a baby Christian. And so it's no surprise when I tell you that assurance of my salvation has been a lifelong struggle, coupled with the fact that I spent many, many, many years struggling with Matthew 12 um, and the unforgivable sin, um, blasphemous thoughts, OCD, and some, and some mental illness on top, and um, and, you know, it, it's been a bumpy ride, guys. <laughs> My faith journey has been a bumpy, bumpy ride. And I know that I'm not alone in this. I know many brothers and sisters, dear, beloved brothers and sisters. My sister Paulette, um, brother Garrett, uh, a brother Mason. He's not on YouTube. You guys probably don't know who he is. But a brother Mason who I, I've had some ups and downs with, who I, I've been talking to recently. And he told me, Michael for my entire faith, I have doubted my salvation. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of doubting. I'm tired of fear. I'm exhausted. And I remember hearing this from him and it's a blessing because Mason was somebody that I encountered early and started trying to witness to and, and talk to about the grace of God. And he was not hearing it. Like he, there was no getting to him. He was sold on the Paul Washer and the Vadi Bauchim. And he was, there was just no getting through to him. And now here, four or five years later, I, I'm hearing him on the phone just bare his soul to me. And he said, you know, Michael, I have for my entire walk as a Christian doubted my salvation. And I don't, I don't want to anymore. I'm exhausted. I can't do it anymore. And um, my heart breaks for those individuals because when I see them, I see myself. And to this day, knowing the gospel the way that I do, I still struggle with those little teachings, those little doctrines in the back of my mind, the, the voice of this one or that one, or certain passages that, you know, people will use that haunt you. I know many of us have those passages. Many There's many passages in the Bible, if we're honest, um, that are very difficult 
to understand and swallow. Even for somebody my, like myself that I, I spent a lot of time studying these things and, and you know, trying to help others and teach others. I mean, there are still, to this day, many passages that are very difficult. I mean, First John is just a really tough book to swallow, guys. Um, and so the reason I'm going on and on about all of this, guys is that we have to be very, very careful when we think that we have gotten so spiritually mature and in the foolishness of our mind have convinced ourselves that we've beaten these kinds of issues, that we forget where we came from and we look down on other believers thinking that we are now better than them, we've moved past them, we've advanced past them because oh, I don't struggle with this anymore, or I don't struggle with that anymore, or I'm, I'm confident in my own confidence. And we get to a place where we become very haughty and high-minded, and we forget where we come from and where we came from. And in that place, it's very easy for us to turn up our nose and look down on our brothers and sisters who are still struggling and think in the foolishness of our mind that we are better than our brother or sister. And... Um, unknowingly take on the voice of the accuser um, to hurt our brothers and sisters in the foolishness of our own mind. Um, and make no mistake, guys, that the enemy, he uses our brothers and sisters sometimes against us. He, that's one of his favorite tactics. He'll use our weaknesses. He'll use our insecurities, our fears. And he'll use these to place seeds of division and strife to create bickering and infighting with the brethren. He will use your brothers and sisters sometimes unknowingly to them to accuse you, to beat you, to bring you down. They don't know it, just like Peter didn't know it when Jesus rebuked him. But oftentimes they might be speaking accusation from the enemy and not words of encouragement from the spirit um, unbeknownst to them. And so he will use your brothers and sisters to kill, steal and destroy and unfortunately, we see this a lot in the church. It's the reason why I found it so hard to find a good physical church, um, because every time I seem to go, <laughs> this is the kind of mentality I find. This, They're not interested in saving souls. They're interested in finding tares, and they're interested in pointing fingers, and they're interested in, in judging and testing and qualifying rather than bringing people to the table of Christ. Um, the church is supposed to be a place for broken people. It's supposed to be a place for imperfect people to get to know a perfect savior. Um, and we're supposed to open our arms to the most broken and the most needy and love them the way that Christ loved the prostitute, the way that Christ loved the tax collector, the way he welcomed them with open arms. And um, unfortunately that is not what the church is today. It's almost impossible to find a church that echoes that. Um, very much, we live in the time of Laodicea, the true Laodicea. I know this this passage has been twisted many times, but um, the issue with Laodicea in their being lukewarm wasn't about um, them not being dedicated enough. Um, it was the fact that they were placing their trust in worldly things, in earthly things, in money and gold, and Christ was outside knocking. It was a Christless Christianity. And that's exactly what we see today. We see a Christless Christianity, a Christianity that's all about you. You proving yourself, you saving yourself, um, you doing enough to prove that you are worthy in some way of salvation, which in and of itself is heresy, because um, there is no such person who is worthy of salvation. But if, you know, they'll twist it, and if it's not directly working for, it's proving you have it to begin with. Are you really one of the elect, right? Are you one of the ones that God has specifically chosen, or are you one of those who is a Judas and was never saved and can never be saved, um, and you were doomed from the start, right? This doctrine of um, extreme Calvinism, where we see that, um, you know, some people are just totally lost without hope, and no matter how badly they want to be saved, they can't be saved, and... This is all very terrifying, you know, for, for many people. And they have these doctrines stuck in the back of their head. And people always have this scripture or that scripture to back it up. And, um, you know, people carry this stuff with them for a long time. And so I say all of this to say that it is 
very common for believers, especially in today's day, to struggle with assurance of their salvation, to doubt whether they're really saved. Um, this does not mean that they're not saved. This is That is hogwash, and it is highly unfortunate that that is being believed and taught within supposed grace circles, that if you doubt your salvation, then that means you're not really saved. That's a bunch of malarkey, and it's a lie. It is not supported by the Bible at all. Um, we are saved by a mustard seed of faith, not by a perfect faith. In fact, we have example after example after example given in Scripture of people with barely any faith who are saved and healed. Um, we have John the Baptist, who was his sole purpose in life was to pave the way for the Messiah. While he was rotting in prison, what did he do? He questioned if Jesus was really the Messiah or not. He had to send out a messenger to ask if Jesus was really the one. You think John the Baptist isn't in heaven right now? You have Peter who denied Christ three times. Thomas, one of the 12 one of the 12 apostles whose name is written on one of the 12 gates of New Jerusalem and he has a throne set uh, you know next to the Father and he's been given authority to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Thomas refused to believe after three and a half years with Christ that he really rose from the dead. He watched Christ raise Lazarus. He watched him heal the sick. He watched him walk on water. And yet he refused to believe that Christ rose from the dead until he was able to see with his own eyes and touch with his own hands. Thomas. You think Thomas isn't in heaven anymore? You think he lost his salvation? You think he proved he was never saved because he refused to believe that Christ was risen until he saw it with his own eyes? Would you call that a perfect faith, guys? One of the 12 apostles who's sitting on one of the 12 thrones and given authority to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That man refused to believe that Jesus rose from the dead until he saw it and felt it with his own eyes and his own hands. Let that sink in for a minute. But we take it upon ourselves to look down at our brothers and sisters because of their weak faith and judge their salvation because of their weak faith. Thinking we're probably not in the right when we do that. Okay? Um, another story that comes to mind is the man who came up to Jesus. He had a sick child and he came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you can heal my child, please heal my child. And Jesus said, what do you mean if? That doesn't sound like a very strong faith, does it? You If? Hey, Jesus, if you can save me, will you please save me? The if is is a sign of, a, of, of barely any faith at all, right? You've just got a mustard seed of faith where you're, Lord, if it's possible, please save me, right? And Jesus says, what do you mean if? And the man says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And did Jesus rebuke him? Did he say, oh, sorry, you pitiful servant. That wasn't enough faith. You failed the test. No, he did not. Without hesitation, the Lord healed his sick child with a mustard seed of faith. God does not require a perfect faith. Why are we requiring a perfect faith from our brothers and sisters? One little final point I want to leave you guys with because the video is going on a little long and I have a concert I have to get to. When talking about the armor of God, I find it interesting that the helmet in the armor is called the helmet of salvation. And I believe that the reason it's called the helmet of salvation is because the enemy is always at work trying to kill, steal, and destroy the believer. He is always at work trying to rob you of your joy, your peace, and your assurance. That is his sole goal in life. If he can't take from you your salvation, he will take from you the joy of your salvation. He will take from you your peace. He will take from you your assurance to make you less effective as an ambassador for God, to ruin your testimony, to make you weak and feeble and unable to serve the kingdom. If he can't take from you your inheritance, he will take from you everything else. And 
that battle is fought here. And that is, and this is why it is called the helmet of salvation. His fiery darts are aimed here in the mind. And it's here that he will try and get you to doubt and question and lack your assurance, take your, steal your assurance from you so that you're lacking in assurance. It's a battle that's waged here, which is why Paul writes epistle after epistle after epistle edifying and encouraging the saints that they can have confidence because the one who made the promise is faithful. Not because they are faithful servants, but because the one who made the promise is faithful. And for that, they can have assurance and they can have full assurance that they are sealed until the day of redemption. And the reason the apostle has to continuously write epistle after epistle after epistle to the churches is because they, like us, also struggled with assurance because when you become a Christian and they don't tell you this in the Christian handbook, but when you become a Christian, you get a big fat target on your back. And from that day forward, the enemy has it out for you because you are one of the seed of God from that moment on. And the enemy is seeking to devour you. He's going after the seed of the woman and he is seeking to destroy you and kill you and rob you of your peace and your assurance and your joy and hurt you in any way that he can. And that happens the moment you move from this world to God's, from this kingdom to God's. From that moment on, you have a target on your back and you will have spiritual attacks. You will have spiritual warfare. The closer you get to God, the heavier the fight will be. It's a war, it's a fight, it's a battle. And the war is raged here. It's not waged with physical swords and physical shields. It's waged here. So anyone who tells you that a true Christian will not doubt their assurance, they are lying to you and they are making themselves to be fools. Because there was a group of people in the Bible who were very sure and very confident of their own salvation. They had no doubt that they would receive the inheritance. And they were Pharisees. And they were wrong. And so the haughtier that we get and the more confident that we get, the farther we are moving away from the character of Christ. Because those things are not valued by God. God is not out looking for strong vessels. He never chose the strong vessels. He chose the weak ones. The ones who were weak by the flesh, the broken vessels, the shepherd boys, the Gideons, the least of their tribe. We, he is strong in our weakness. So when we position ourselves to a place of greatness and we start to fool ourselves and thinking, oh, I've beaten this and I've surmounted this and I'm better than this one and look at me, look how far I've come and we snub our nose at our brothers who are still in the mire. Not the place we want to be, guys. And I've said this before in some of my other videos and some of my other, uh, I think it was a post that I wrote a long time ago, that I often wonder about these so-called Christians who they have it all together and they're doing so well and they never struggle. Um, they apparently, according to them, don't have any serious sin struggles. They never doubt their salvation. They seem so confident and so put together. And my Pharisee alarm. Pharisee. Pharisee starts to go off, guys, because that's not what the Bible teaches about the Christian life. The Bible doesn't teach this prosperity gospel garbage, live your best life now. The Bible teaches that there will be tribulation for the saints in this world, that you should expect war. When you enter the kingdom of God right now, when you become a believer, you better have your sword and shield and your armor on because you're entering a war. And if you're not feeling war, if you're not, if you don't understand what it is to struggle, if Romans 7 doesn't make any sense to you and you think you've got it all together and you've beaten it and you don't doubt, you don't question, your life is hunky-dory, you don't have any sin struggles, that's the person that needs to worry. That's the person that I would say needs to worry because my Pharisee alarm goes off. Real, real, real Pharisee. 
That's the person that needs to worry. Because that's not what the Bible talks about when it, when it references a believer. The life of a believer is not easy. He, uh, Jesus says that if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But the world hates you because I have chosen you out of the world. And this world, this world system that we walk around in, that we live in right now, unfortunately for the time being, it's run by Satan. And that's why you see unbelievers, Satan's not going about trying to devour unbelievers. You don't see Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Bill Gates or uh, George Soros or any of these other big names. They're not struggling. They're living their best life. They have their reward. The enemy's not going after them. He's not beating on them. They're living a great life. They got their mansions and they got their yachts and they got their big pent room apartments and they're just doing fine. They're not worried about the next life. They have got themselves convinced they're immortal. They'll never die. Apparently, I guess. The enemy's not out beating on their door. He's not out devouring them in their mind. He's not. They're not afraid. They're not worried about these things. But the believer, the believer in Jesus Christ, let me make something clear. The servant is not greater than the master. If the master was persecuted, so will you be persecuted. And just look back in history, some of the greatest men and women of God. The reformers, the people who moved away from the Catholic Church, many of them were killed, arrested, burned, defamed, and many of them were very scrupulous. They struggled with, with lack of assurance. Martin Luther, that's one of, that's his story. That's what caused him to, to start the Reformation was just that overbearing burden that he felt under the law that was being preached to him through the Catholic Church. He was, he was a Catholic priest at the time, and it was his own OCD, his own scruples when being buried under the, the weight of the law that finally broke him to the point where the Reformation happened. God uses people who struggle in this way mightily. And guys, God does not require a perfect faith. And none of us, make no mistake, none of us have a perfect faith. And we don't have any right to judge our brothers and sisters by their faith, okay? You do not have any right to pick up your nose and scorn at your brother and sister because he's weak or she's weak or she's doubting. That's not what the Bible tells us. We're supposed to be edifying and lifting up our weakened brothers and sisters, not putting ourselves first, not letting our jealousy and our envy cause us to want to hurt our brothers and sisters in passive aggressive ways, not going about trying to destroy our brothers and sisters, not trying to steal glory for ourselves and putting ourselves first instead of considering our brothers and sisters, not keeping long lists of sins that we've committed and accusing our brothers and sisters. None of these things are what we should be doing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And unfortunately, and I see this in my own life, it's something that I always have to battle with myself, that the more wisdom and the more understanding and spiritual growth that God gives us, the more at risk we are of allowing that to turn into pride. And I believe personally that this is the reason that God allowed the thorn in Paul's flesh. Because Paul was given a huge, even in comparison to the other apostles, Paul was given a huge amount of understanding and wisdom that, that none of the other apostles even had. Um, when it comes to the gospel of Christ. And he was given an enormous amount of wisdom. And I think that the Lord allowed him to continue to have that thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. Because the more that we're given, the more gifts that we're given, the more understanding that we're given, the more spiritual blessings that we're given, um, the more risk for us to allow pride to creep in, to allow pride to infect us. And I think we should all ponder on that for a moment, because I know we've all looked at brothers and sisters at times and we've 
been jealous. Well, why does he have more than I have? Why does he understand things more than I understand things? And I would warn you, brothers and sisters, that you get what you ask for. You get what you pay for. And with with great power and great gifts come enormous responsibility. The apostles were given enormous amount of spiritual blessings and gifts, and they had an enormous amount of responsibility. And all of them, except John, suffered terrible deaths as martyrs. With great gifts come great responsibility. So when you ask God to eat from that, for, to drink from that cup, as the apostles asked Jesus, count the cost. Count the cost. And when you look at a brother or sister and you envy or you covet something that they have or God has given them and you get angry and jealous and you want it for yourself, count the cost. Because sometimes we're not ready. Sometimes we're not ready for that breakthrough. Sometimes we're not ready for that understanding because every time God gives us, it's always, there's always that little seedling of possibility that our flesh wants to glory in itself. Our flesh wants to take that and say, whoop, look what I did. Whoop, God loves me more. Whoop, look what God gave me. Trust me, guys. Guilty. I've done it. I've done it. Every time God gifts us and he gives us a sign or a gift or a blessing, there's always that little bit of inkling of the flesh to want to take credit or to pride in yourself. And we got to be careful, guys, because we're not always ready. And it can put us backwards instead of forwards. And I, should, I think we should all be really, really careful with that. So rest assured, brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with doubt about your salvation, you are in good company. You're not alone. Many, many, many great men and women of God have struggled in a very similar way. And if you're struggling with spiritual attack and these kinds of fears and worries, take heed that the Lord is refining you, that he's allowing you to be tested in this way and sifted in this way. And the reason that you're going through that, my brothers or sisters, is because you have a big fat target on your back. If you were not God's child, you wouldn't be worried about it. This, this would not be a struggle that you have because the enemy is not worried about unbelievers. He's not worried about the tares, guys. He's worried about the sheep and the wheat. Those are the ones he's targeting. Those are the ones he's persecuting. Those are the ones he's going after. So take heed, brothers and sisters. I love you guys, and I'll talk to you soon.